Good afternoon, everyone. This is United Medical ACO. My name is Kamal Arkan. Today is January 21st, Friday. Uh, Delaware Health and Community Updates is our goal for today again, uh, our weekly event. Uh, I have uh, Sean Bergman, uh, who is uh, helping uh, for this event to happen. And he does put a lot of time with me for these. Thank you, uh, Sean, joining me. How are you doing? Of course, not a problem. I'm doing well. How about yourself today? Very good. So we are going to go ahead and start. Uh, we have some updates from the uh, COVID-related issues, and we have some healthcare-related updates. And later on, uh, Katie is going to join us uh, for uh, revenue cycle management uh, updates. So we'll go from there. Uh, first and most, let's start with our agenda. Um, All right, so. Yeah, so we have our uh, cartoons again um, this week on the US News. Uh, we have a couple of features, we have two. Um, starting on the left, we have Dr. Fauci. Um, obviously, for those who know the Looney Tunes uh, cartoon, uh, doing a spinoff on that with the Looney Times. Um, and obviously the slogan with Looney Tunes was, you know, that's all folks, meaning obviously at the end of the episode. Um, a conclusion to the event, but here it's loony times because it says that's not all folks. So obviously uh, Dr. Fauci here, the new variants um, kind of taking the stab and it's kind of a never ending uh, thing with the new variants keeping, uh, keep emerging. Uh, so, you know, we're hoping that we are progressing to a, a, a finish. Uh, obviously the sooner the better, um, but that's kind of where that stab is going. That it just seems to be a never ending if there's a new one. So Sean, do you have any idea about Dr. Fauci's age? I know he's older than me. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Everyone is older than you. <laughs> All right. 23. All right. So he's over 80. Okay. Wow. And, all right. So what's happening yeah. with the good numbers? Yeah. Um, so here, uh, as we know, we do have that spike uh, from all the way back almost New Year's time uh, into the beginning, first two weeks of January, and it seems to be continuing. Up until uh, this kind of last week, you kind of see the that uh, spike starting to come down just a little bit in the graph. So uh, as we highlighted there, the number that we're only down to 750,000 cases as it was 770. So kind of reached the peak and are now on our way back down, um, at least in the United States specifically uh, with those numbers right there on the chart. And then again, another graph, this one may be a little bit easier to visualize that spike coming down as the, the red trend line is highlighted. Um, but you see there's that one day surge again, as around New Year's. I know with the holidays closed, a lot of the counting was suspended for a day or two. So kind of all piled up. Um, but overall cases look like they're on the downtrend now that we kind of reached that record number now heading down. And then also just to keep in the back of our minds that, you know, it's not necessarily the number of cases, but kind of the severity associated with them. So I know uh, a lot of people uh, who may be getting the Omicron variant may just be a two, three day cold, you know, testing positive, but overall the severity is not, not anything near that we saw with Delta variant. And then, yeah, just the United States vaccinations here, um, highlight at the top that we had administered at least 530 million doses. That's an increase of 8 million from last week. So pretty uh, significant number right there, um, enough to cover about 80% of our population. You know, this may be attributed to uh, the, the pediatric population a little while ago um, was made able to, they were able to receive the vaccine. And I know maybe some parents weren't super urgent on getting them done, uh, thinking, you know, put it off, not super urgent. But now that we did see those record number spikes, that may have uh, helped influence um, some parents maybe getting their, their children uh, vaccinated sooner. So that may be why we saw uh, a significant increase uh, up 8 million in the last week for the United States. So uh, last night in our providers meeting, um, we had uh, these numbers. Um, let me actually just uh, see if I can bring it up. So I did send you a link um, uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. So just to break down of the hospital uh, hospitalization and who's actually really vaccinated and who's not and what booster really does. Uh, so 
and I do want to bring this up so that we can share. Um, so the booster actually is the key. So if they the people don't have their boosters, so this is the main thing that's going to uh, protect that's going to protect you against the uh, Omicron variant. So now this is something that I was actually just looking for uh, this morning uh, when we were giving the overall numbers. We don't want to actually assume everyone is not vaccinated, but um, getting boosted was ninety percent effective. Uh, versus getting two shots is like 57%. So this is what I was looking for last night. So that actually is a pretty um, uh, powerful uh, statistics. So I think people should really know this. So 90 versus 57. Now, all, even at 90%, that means 10% chance of not, uh, it may not work. So, but 90% is a really good number to have. So when... Uh, we are actually, uh, we are kind of, uh, uh, we are fighting against these uh, statistics. So we want to increase those numbers as uh, much as possible, uh, our chances of not getting it. So that's kind of like what we are trying to do. So what's the overall numbers that we have? Yep. So again, the United States uh, are almost at 210 million uh, people being fully vaccinated. And then again, with that booster that you're just touching on there, uh, we have almost 82 million people uh, having received a booster dose. Um, so like you said, you know, obviously getting the booster is definitely going to help your chances of not, uh, you know, getting the COVID virus. And obviously anybody would agree that you'd rather have 90% chance of not getting it as opposed to almost a flip of a coin at, you know, 57. So obviously it's super significant. And, you know, as we see, those numbers are still steadily rising. So it's definitely good. Uh, good to see. And then also, um, you know, kind of just the antibodies with having such a large number of cases with the Omicron, um, even those who maybe are not necessarily getting vaccinated kind of have at least, if they did uh, test positive for COVID, you know, they at least have something in their body helping fight against it. So uh, overall, uh, pretty optimistic, I'd say, uh, on the future on uh, these COVID numbers and the cases. And then again, just the severity that we're seeing. I just think it will not be as severe. Um, as we proceed forward. Yep. And then here we have our numbers uh, for Delaware. Um, so as you see here, uh, fully vaccinated uh, over 630,000. Um, so it's, it's a good number to see. Obviously we're hoping it goes higher. Uh, you know, we see total vaccines administered uh, over one and a half million. So pretty good uh, for Delaware here. And then, um, Obviously, it's uh, broken down by the vaccine status of uh, their age. Uh, so fully vaccinated, 65 plus community is still leading, leading those groups at uh, 93%. So the main uh, issue these days is um, the, the mask that we are wearing, what type of mask we are wearing, um, and how uh, we are utilizing it, where we are utilizing it right now, the indoor is mandated. But I think uh, we cannot emphasize the mask utilization enough. So uh, everyone should be uh, using a good quality mask and not to make that uh, lightly because that is the main uh, protection these days. So uh, from our United Medical Clinic side, we do have an update. Um, uh, so far practices right now, uh, they are gonna be, they, they started being under uh, one uh, umbrella, uh, Medical Associates of Bear and Dr. Irene Zero. Now they are gonna be with uh, United Medical Clinic. We welcome them. Uh, they started as of January 1. Uh, right now we are about, I believe 17 or 18 providers total. So we are gonna ask uh, Katie Needles, uh, one of our client managers to join us and we are gonna discuss a uh, revenue cycle uh, overview from United Medical side and Katie, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. You see, it's always better with the fact. <laughs> so uh, Katie is gonna. Uh, we have done this in a couple different uh, sessions, but uh, as we 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 actually um, we have a couple different purposes with these events. We try to reach out to our patients. We try to reach out to our uh, employees, and also we try to reach out to the public and some uh, potential clients. So uh, it's a good way to communicate with a lot of different uh, people 
uh, from the same channel. So this is one of those where uh, every other week we are rotating uh, between the revenue cycle management and the clinical uh, issues. So today is the revenue cycle management uh, week. So uh, Katie, you are on. Okay, thanks. Okay. And get started whenever we get this first slide here. So um, as Kamal said, I, uh, my name is Katie Needles. I am a client manager here at United Medical and I'm in the accounts receivable department. So um, what we really work on on my side is revenue cycle management. So we do have many clients that we do the medical billing for, but more than that, we want to make sure that the revenue cycle, the entire process of seeing the patients, collecting any revenue, that it's comprehensive. The way that we're able to do that is by partnering with Cerner and Cerner Resources. So we use PowerChart as our EMR. We use two practice management systems of SPM and CPM. So that's where they're actually going to enter the visits. And then that all interacts with QuickBase. It's a constant feedback system. So PowerChart can talk to SPM, can talk to QuickBase. Everything is able to communicate in a cycle. Um, this is a very tiny screen, but basically this is just a summary of our workflow. So if you take a look at the top up there, we start with the doctor's office and it's going to work its way through. Whenever a charge is entered, there's many opportunities where something could go wrong. And part of my team, um, the goal is that we want to reduce those errors and get that claim process as quickly as possible. The charge is going to start with the doctor's office. And from there, it's going to go to the United Medical Systems Verification. At that point, it'll go through a scrubbing process. Is there anything wrong with the name? Is there anything wrong with the zip code? Any sort of a manual error that we're able to fix. Um, after that, it's gonna go through our clearinghouse, go through electronically. That's where the claims are going to be sent to the insurance. No more of all paper claims. This is all electronic, um, which allows us to get payments faster. Um, after we go through that, the insurance will accept the claims. And after that, they'll come back as ERAs, which are electronic remittance advices, or sometimes on paper EOBs. This is where the insurance is going to give us a determination of what happened with that claim. Was it paid? Was it denied? At that point, my team will take over and either the payment posting department will post or my team will work on correcting that denial. Denials can come from a multitude of reasons, whether the patient wasn't eligible. Sometimes we do have to fight with the insurance. Sometimes they're legitimate things. And unfortunately, sometimes we do have to fight a little bit to get things paid. But that's what my team works on from those EOBs. We also utilize a reimbursement manager. That's the way that we organize our claims in order to see what needs to be worked. It's a queue of sorts that we can work through those denials. All of that goes to the AR team. And at that point, we're going to chunk it up a couple different ways. Does it need to go to a secondary insurance? Do we need to bill the patient for a copay, coinsurance, deductible, or is that the end of it? But it's a whole uh, cycle here for the revenue cycle. So the um, if they are rejected um, at this point, then? Correct. So if we do have a rejection, it'll go back to the AR team, and then it goes back up and goes back through the process. Yep. So all right, uh, so I will clear this. So um, this is our clearinghouse and our denial management. As I mentioned, uh, part of the big thing that we do is work on rejections and denials. So um, on that top where it's highlighted in green, it says manage payments and manage reimbursements. We're able to work the denied claims from there. Right underneath of that, where there's that orange highlighting, we can work the rejected claims. Essentially, Trizetto is almost like a toll bridge of sorts where claims have to be passed through the scrubber and then they'll come back from the insurance. All right, so this is gonna talk about our decode, our denial code correction system. And this is how we ensure precise reporting. So often insurances will come back with a really vague denial or some sort of a communication that doesn't always make sense, or they'll have a code that says PR288. So rather than presenting that to the providers, which doesn't make a lot of sense, we have a coding system called denial codes, where we look at the reason why the claim was denied. Was the insurance wrong? Was there no inferral, uh, no referral? Was there no authorization? 
Um, that left snippet there, that left picture is a picture of SPM where we did put in a decode BCVD where um, we identified that COVID shots actually have to go to Medicare if the patient has a managed Medicare. What we do with this system, as you can see on the right, is we have a lot of different codes that we utilize this to report back to the client on a monthly basis of, you know, we had 30 eligibility issues this month or 20 patients had uh, Medicare and we need to send the vaccines there. It's a really good feedback mechanism so that the office can identify issues that they're able to resolve on their end, which in turn will reduce denials and increase revenue. Um, kind of already touched on this a little bit, but SPM reporting. So we have different mechanisms for daily, monthly, and scheduling that are all going to work between SPM and through QuickBase. Some of the daily reporting will be that we use SPM to track our daily codes. So as I mentioned, those denial codes before, it also doubles as a way for us to see what our employees are working on. How many denials are we able to work through in a given day? All of this, we're able to work with QuickBase, and it makes it a very easy, easy format for us to monitor the decodes, the production, the denial rates. We also send out monthly reports to all of our clients where we compile all of those decodes and present it to them. Um, Kamal, you can speak on the scheduling portion if you want, but um, I do know we also use uh, QuickBase to assist in that as well, mostly for Krios and other clients like that. For the, uh, the, the, the on the SPM side with the uh, practice management uh, portion is done through the scheduling. So it's not just the billing part, but it's uh, also the, uh, the scheduling and registration, they're all done through the, um, uh, through the PM system. So SPM is not just for the billing. That's, uh, that's what we have that, uh, why we have it there. So because like many, um, so uh, let me actually for a second. So many uh, practices, many uh, revenue cycle management companies, they were not actually sharing. Uh, they were not using the same real-time systems with the billing companies, with the revenue cycle uh, companies. So what's, what's being used in the office versus what's used in the uh, practices with the uh, vendors, they were different. So because we have it all integrated with the uh, offices, so then we don't have that problem. So we do want to emphasize that they can actually do their scheduling through the system. Uh, that's the scheduling. In the quick base reporting, so we do have many different specialties that we do the billing for. Other than behavioral health and dental, I think we've done all of the different specialties that are out there. So we'll have urology, podiatry, pulmonology, we have uh, cardiovascular, but then we have regular PCPs as well. So QuickBase allows us to separate those denials out. We're not going to compare the American Surgery Center to Brandywine Podiatry to United Medical Clinic. They're all going to have very unique issues with unique specialties. Um, on a monthly basis, we compile those reports, as I said, and we'll look at three-month averages to see what are the trends. Um, we're able to separate that out by the different specialties. Each one, like I said, is going to require different setups. So the American Surgery Center is going to be very different than brand new podiatry that could maybe utilize DME or durable medical equipment for a patient's um, foot, they need actual physical items here. So it's, it's really helpful for us to be able to differentiate between the types of specialties. This allows us to um, just really differentiate between the practices. Thank you. So um, for our collections process, we do implement efficient processes through SPM that identifies patients with overdue balances. Generally, we do have statements that are sent out to the patients, but after that, our collection teams reviews the accounts to assure that sufficient statements have been sent to patients prior to including them on the collections list. Our practices do have the opportunity to go through that list and double check everything, make sure that it's all um, up to date according to their standards before they are transferred to a third party collections agency. This is gonna result in a cleaner system. We don't want balances to be sitting out for years and years with no sort of collection. That's not really ideal for the revenue process. 
All right, on to client satisfaction. So um, our team worked really hard here and we're always looking for opportunities to improve, but we do send out client satisfaction surveys either on a monthly or on a quarterly basis. So as of last year, our billing department has a 97.2 positive client satisfaction rating when asked if they were satisfied with the services provided by United Medical. Um, we have a couple of nice quotes here um, pulled from a different, a couple different teams. I um, do have a couple of mine on there, which is always encouraging to see that the providers and the office managers that they really do appreciate the work that we're putting in here. So I think uh, right now we are at in the last three four quarters, uh, it is one hundred percent. Yep, I think that's on the next slide as well. Um, for if they're satisfied with the um, billing itself, it was actually at one hundred percent. Um, with the client managers, which again is pretty fantastic and makes us feel really happy to do our jobs when we have 100% satisfaction rating. Um, payment posting managers have earned a 95.9% approval. And it's not that they're not at 100%, but often there's a lot more that goes into payment posting. And we're always taking the feedback from our clients to figure out what posting mechanisms we can improve on. All right, I believe. Um... All right. Do we have time for this one as well? Come on. Okay. So um, just speaking of our billing, so the, the point of the revenue cycle management is anybody can just do billing or anybody can post payments. But the idea of revenue cycle management is that we want to use a comprehensive system, comprehensive um, systems that are going to talk with each other, that are going to interact and um, ultimately to increase revenue. So whenever we take over on a client, on average, we see a revenue increase between 5 and 15% after that takeover. We have seen clients that have gone up from that um, between 20 and 35% over a period of one to two years. A lot of this is because we're able to streamline that process and make sure we're looking holistically rather than chunking items up. Um, for a client example, we had a new podiatry client that joined United Medical in April of 2018. And the client was already using the same platform. So we didn't take them from another software system. They were still using SPM. United Medical was able to increase the revenue by 32% at the end of 2019. Um, that just really show, goes to show that you can be using the software system, but the unique revenue cycle approach is really beneficial for the practice. So as um, that last bullet, we are really focused on working together. So um, I think um, just this... Um past week, uh, and this was one of your clients, what I realized, uh, it's been almost 22 years that I've been doing this. Uh, and as I said, I think that everything is more straightforward and more streamlined. Uh, insurance companies are more uh, creative. So, and although the regulations are very heavy, um, insurance companies are finding their way to do stuff um, in a way that if they are able to get away or if they are not being caught, then they can do stuff. And for example, one of the, we won't mention the name, but one of the uh, Medicaid managed care companies in Delaware is doing a prepay uh, visit, right? Was it the prepay payment? Essentially, they're doing audits prior to issuing payment. It's almost like a penalty for the uh, for the practice. So basically what it is is that they don't pay until they receive the claim, they ask for medical records, and then they review the medical records. This is a very lengthy process. It can be, and they don't have resources. <laughs> That's the other thing. They don't have the right place to send the uh, medical records. I don't know if it's deliberate or not. And they also did not communicate this in the proper format. So, and it's against their contract with us and with the state. And this happens. So, and you would think that this happens in some third world country, but it happens in the United States. So, and that's why when we are actually doing everything that we can and we do, this still happens in, in today's um, uh, insurance uh, revenue cycle management world. So that's why we have to do what we have to do at the best level that we are doing. So Katie was part of that uh, uh, investigation that we did with that client. And um, when when that's needed, you need all the expertise all together. And it's not just with one person, but our entire team was there. Um, and that's what's needed from the revenue cycle management. And uh, Katie is one of the best 
uh, managers that we have. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for being with us. Yes. And thank you for the presentation. Okay. All right, so we are gonna go to a little bit more fun, maybe stuff. <laughs> so, uh, Sean, are you back? I am back. All right. Ready for the fun. All right. There we go. So the loser of the week. You know, um, I never liked him as a tennis player, so I'm a tennis player. So, uh, but he is a miserable person. And uh, but why is he the loser of the week? Not because he beat uh, this person up. Oh uh, <laughs> no, yeah, that was uh, that was at the the U.S. Open when he had. I don't know if it was out of frustration he didn't get a call, but yeah, tennis ball. <laughs> Line judge's neck, Djokovic got him uh, tossed from the tournament. He hit the line person, but that's that's not the reason for him to be the loser of the week. It's because he was uh, out from Australia, and now he's not able to go to French Open. He won't go to most likely the US Open, and he's not gonna most likely go to UK. Um, so why do we have to discuss this in the in yeah, the session, right. it's, because it's all happening because he's not getting vaccinated. Yeah, he is not getting the vaccine, not getting vaccinated, um, which obviously it goes against the protocols of these uh, particular tournaments that all the other um, assuming participants, obviously officials, fans, anyone who might be attending uh, are all obviously following accordingly. And uh, so he's back home now. Yeah, I think he's from Serbia, right? Yeah. He's having coffee with his prime minister. <laughs> okay, so, okay, more serious stuff. Um, what's happening here, Sean? Yeah, so uh, obviously COVID, we're trying to see, is it actually winding down, you know, with these new variants, how if it's, you know, uh, spreading more, more quickly and more people are getting, we have antibodies, we have more vaccines, more vaccination going on. Is it actually going to dwindle? And uh, the WHO kind of uh, taking again another stab at the, the vaccine distribution. Um, they're kind of saying that we want to get as many people vaccinated in, in a shorter period of time. That way the virus doesn't have a chance to again mutate and have new strands uh, kind of take off. So you want to kind of get it all at once in a more efficient manner. And uh, by doing that, um, it's saying that we kind of have to direct efforts towards some of the poor, maybe third world countries that aren't necessarily able to afford or uh, administer vaccines at the rate of which uh, more wealthier countries, more affluent ones are able to do. So they actually, we had the breakdown of those uh, countries where the, uh, the vaccination ratio is, right? So it shows- yeah, so uh, this little uh, graphic that I kind of put together here uh, on the left side, we have uh, some of the poorer countries. Um, so just numbers I threw in there for our data to be compared is we kind of have the total population of these countries, how many COVID cases they saw, and then of those cases, how many were resulting in death. And uh, if you look at the highlighted that you're actually circling there in the yellow, that is also going to note the number uh, well, the percentage of the population that has uh, been vaccinated. So if you look at the poorer countries, um, if their percentage in the percentage of cases that resulted in death are a little bit higher. So you see Somalia had over 5% of the cases resulting in death. Liberia was at 4%. And if you see that they have really low percentages in vaccination, um, as you just circled there in those uh, yellow highlighted spots. Whereas on the right-hand side, we have our uh, wealthier countries. So you see the US, Japan, Luxembourg. And uh, if you look at the percentage, so even there at the bottom, Luxembourg, um, having 124,000 cases of those only, you know, less than 1,000 resulted in death. So, you know, it's less than a percent. But then if you look right below it, percentage of their population vaccinated is almost 95%. So, it's, it's obviously not a coincidence, you know, there's some type of direct correlation here with a vaccine and uh, the death rate uh, that you're seeing with people who are contracting uh, the COVID virus. And uh, like I said, not a coincidence. There's definitely a little bit of science behind the numbers there. What we know from this is that when you, uh, it's, when you have the money, uh, you get the vaccine. When you don't have money, you don't get the vaccine. Is that 
Yeah, that's kind of the gist of it, and that's kind of what the the WHO is kind of trying to uh, say. If we could, you know, help out uh, or kind of be a little bit more efficient with the distribution uh, to those countries who maybe can't afford it or is having difficulties uh, administering. Things may change soon because uh, the inflation is uh, everywhere, and including in the U.S., right? Yep. That person is not even the right number, but that's the official number for now. Yeah, so, I mean, if you look at particular goods and services, I know even across the sectors, I think the energy sector uh, was the highest of inflation that was impacted. But if you look at other things like gasoline prices, um, it even it's kind of odd. If you look at the prices of used cars, uh, they actually beat the S&P 500 index on uh, return uh, just because of the inflation. So obviously 7% is kind of the average that they're doing. But if you look at spe- uh, specific goods in certain sectors, it's actually way above 7%. Um, so if you see here, it's kind of breaking down the U.S. in different uh, geographic areas. Um, so how much it was to fill the tank uh, and the percent change from the year 2020 to 21. And uh, across the board, obviously, it's an increase. If you look at all those trend lines going up and to the right, um, especially even like look at California. I think they always have the most expensive gas, um, obviously, increasing across the nation. Well, this, this is actually one of the things that we've been talking about, right? So that is... Um... And I keep saying the same thing, and then uh, I'm never happy when I'm right with these types of stuff. So um, these are um, these are videos. I'm going to try to play to see how it's going to show. Um, these are from the local supermarkets. I'm not using anyone else's um, uh, videos. These are from, I think it's from Alchemy. Um, So this is one, and then this is another one. Um, I had actually one picture from the week before. And so this is a little bit closer pictures. So uh, with the inflation and everything else, but then there's also the the lack of goods uh, in these stores because people are not working with a lot of restrictions that we have. So, What's, uh, what's expecting us is that um, I think there will be some type of crisis going to happen, economic crisis. I don't think people are understanding this. Um, yeah, because, I mean, another thing, too, um, I know right now, actually, truck drivers, uh, there's kind of a shortage of truck drivers nationally and obviously in high demand. The wages actually to be a truck driver right now are actually really high compared to what they normally are just because of that supply and demand. And um, it's kind of a, a sign that may help us, you know, predict what's coming. Like you're saying, a little bit of crisis if, you know, there's just not not the effort and supply, um, even in the workforce. Like you're saying, that you kind of need to keep up with uh, what we're used to having. So, like uh, maybe next uh, next week we can use this uh, graph here. But what it shows is the purchase power of the uh, dollar. Yep, and it's not a good graph to be looking at. So. Oh, You're saving account. money, yeah, saving money in cash. People well, understand this. They think that we are talking about something uh, political here, but it's not. It's just like, uh, you know what it is. Like sometimes, uh, I mean, I'm not out there shopping a lot, but I know uh, what it costs like 10 years ago versus what it costs today. So right. then uh, when, when it's expensive, it's expensive. When it's more today, it's more. So you feel it. Now, um, uh, when... You know, sometimes in the American culture, we have this issue of um, when there's a little storm, then the stores are empty. Mm-hmm. Kind of yeah. that. But now what, what we see is uh, with, the, with the COVID, it's, it's almost like a permanent um, uh, lack of goods there. So that's happening. So it is, it's out there. Um, anyhow. So one of the other things that we are going to discuss today, which we did introduce the uh, narrow link, um, uh, and we, we find this interesting and hopefully everyone else does. Uh, we wanted to kind of deep dive into the narrow link a little bit more. Um, personally, I want to understand a little bit better. And uh, luckily, uh, Sean agreed that he wants to understand this a little bit more. So we are doing a little bit more reading and understanding. So, um, this is going to this this has a future in healthcare for sure. So, uh, how it works, uh, understanding the brain, interfacing with the brain, and engineering with the brain. These are directly from their website. This is the future of um, uh, healthcare. 
uh, whether we like it or not, it's going to be there. Now, I own a surgery center. When I was going through this, my first reaction, one of my uh, reactions, not the first reaction is, well, maybe we can do this at the surgery center like in the next couple of years. So uh, I borrowed this image from one of the videos and basically um, a small uh, uh, object is being uh, implanted on the uh, scalp here. And it does, um, it does actually uh, have a lot of, um, it promises a lot. So yeah. now, uh, now it actually, now, from the time that we, discuss this to the time now there are new stuff coming up so now they are talking about the, another interface with the uh, metaverse uh, that we are going to discuss um, so Sean talk to, the, talk, yeah. talk to us about the uh, simulation yeah so um, right here obviously like Kamal said we are expanding on the Neuralink you know um, with, with the different stimulation and how it's going to interact with the neurons in the brain um, you know we talked a little bit, uh, I think it might have been like two or three weeks ago when we first introduced it, um, how we thought that we saw the monkey actually being able to move uh, the computer with its brain just by uh, the chip in the brain reading the, the neural network, uh, the synap you know, between the synapses and the neuron and the, the uh, feed. Mm -hmm. But now we're also seeing that it may be used for, you know, almost a memory sort of storage you think of almost like a hard drive backup type approach where not necessarily um, just on say that that particular instance of, you know, maybe solving paralysis, uh, more of the physical side of healthcare, but also we have that mental where, you know, like you're saying the memory storage, um, more of a psychology, cognitive um, approach, obviously cognitive with the brain, uh, but as opposed to not just a physical, you know, being able to give access to maybe limbs that were previously uh, paralyzed, but also like a memory. So like you're saying, uh, I think it was a few weeks ago, you mentioned that not necessarily always to be used in patients who may have um, a disability or a health concern, but also in people who are considered, you know, to be the most part overall healthy, um, that would be able to be uh, implemented into them as well. Yeah. And um, the, uh... The other thing is, uh, we know that there are certain condi conditions these days, uh, it comes with the aging and the Alzheimer is one of them. Now we had our providers meeting last night and one of the issues that came up um, uh, was the, the medication is used for Alzheimer, which is about 60,000 a year today. When I was doing the research on the, uh, the cost of potential cost of the Neuralink, uh, they talk about maybe like 5,000 uh, per implementation, uh, so per implant. Well, today someone is willing to pay 60000 uh, a year for medication that may or may not work. And then we actually, um, let me actually just go to the, did we have the medication on the later part? Look, um, it should be, I only exactly. had it in one of the slides there. Um, but yeah, uh, looking at those, the medication costs there, obviously, when you compare the two, you know. Uh, so if, like, if, if you're going to spend that kind of money, uh, yeah. then, then you are kind of, yeah, it's, it's actually a little bit in the, uh, let's just bring it up. So, so this is, this is real. So mm -hmm. 56,000 a year. So if someone lives two, three, four years with the Alzheimer's disease, so they can actually cause two, 250 to 300,000 just for one medication. But something like this, something like Neuralink can actually be the answer for many of these. Now, of course, it needs to be regulated. That's different. Now, uh, we are going to actually study this more and more, uh, and we are going to bring this up, and uh, we are going to know more about it. But uh, one of the things that we started, uh, we are asking our people uh, whether or not they want to have this. Um, uh, now, before I go to that, um, Sean, tell me about this slide. Yeah, so here, um, if you see person of the year in the Time magazine cover, Elon Musk and you know, I think in the news, sometimes people maybe only see a, a little portion of, of an event or a person or something and kind of just associate that, associate that uh, as a one-to-one. -one. 
But, you know, I don't think if you zoom out, I don't know if a lot of people realize uh, how many other different companies and kind of innovative technologies has actually been involved with um, across across the board. So, you know, you're looking at some of our popular companies here that he's either the CEO of or has actually helped start. So you look at, you know, PayPal, the SpaceX, he's looking to obviously that's technology and, and innovative uh, ideas there, obviously with our outer space and, you know, the rockets and trying to just obviously advance in that field too. But obviously Tesla with our uh, auto driving cars now that they have that feature in some of the Teslas. So a lot of the artificial intelligence uh, across his companies is kind of a common theme there. And obviously Neuralink clearly relying on the artificial intelligence there. Your point is that if he's, if he has done all these, so this is going to work uh, at some point. Yeah, I would say not a, again, not a coincidence. Um, he's obviously had uh, numerous successful companies there. So Obviously, he has enough resources, and I know in our previous video, um, a lot of people were saying, "Oh, what's you know uh, the the risk and how the safety concerns and what percentages they have to meet." And he was saying how even Tesla, as his other company, um, they exceed what the FDA requires as the minimum safety. So especially with Neuralink, he wants to be safer than what's even the minimum required, which obviously is a, a optimistic and a good sign as someone who's behind this. Hollywood, one, one really important part with Neuralink is one is you can actually move objects with the, with the, uh, the thoughts in the brain. Yep. Like you can actually, without actually touching them, Correct. Yeah. So it, it's the, the chip in there would actually read the neural signals that your brain is sending and it actually interprets them and then uh, would result in the physical. Uh, and the effect. other thing is that the actual interface of um, something is being uploaded into your brain. Yeah. So there's obviously the computer signals. Right. So uh, something is being downloaded. So it's something that you don't know and it's being downloaded. So those are like. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it, it's scary. But once you know what the future is and what we have done in the last uh, 20, 30 years, mm-hmm. so uh, look at the next 30 years, this is going to happen. So it just needs to be regulated properly and yeah, needs to be controlled well. But uh, it has a lot of uh, promises, good yeah. promises. And a I lot of potential, for sure. Potential. And, uh, you know, another thing, too, with those computers is that... Uh, as people may know, computer systems learn themselves. So with, I don't want to necessarily use the, the verse trial and error, because obviously we're talking about eventually getting to humans, but um, with different different examples to say, the computer will learn itself and begin to almost reprogram itself to become more efficient and obviously minimize those uh, percent chances of error in the future to become even more safe, more efficient in its operating. Definitely. So, but here is uh, with the limited number so far that we have, uh, here is what people answered. Twelve uh, percent says yes, they would uh, uh, get the implants, and forty-seven percent said no, and then forty-one percent said maybe. So I will keep this poll open, uh, and then we'll periodically will uh, give an update. But actually, right now it's fifty-three percent. So it's like the Republicans and Democrats. There you go, sitting on the fence right there. <laughs> so. Um, I didn't say which one is which, though, right? So, um, uh, but it's close. Uh, that means people are open. Um, so that's what we have for today. We'll be back next week with different uh, things. But Neuralink is going to be uh, our one of our uh, focuses um, uh, for this year, and we just want to learn more and uh, know more about it, learn more about it, and hopefully we can share those with you. Uh, who knows, maybe one of those days Elon Musk will join our session. So it's all possible, right? So we'll be back in 10 minutes with the Bariatric Friday with Dr. Irgal. Uh, until then, stay safe. And if you don't see you next uh, at the next session, uh, please uh, use your mask and have a nice